and life. Most of you have been, were, were displaced from the church. Wanderers, hoppers, right? Mere observers. Before you started coming here. Now you're at home. Now you are finding community. And you are becoming active and practicing and participating in the faith. The Word of God has changed all of our lives for the better forever. And that has come. Think about this. This is what I thought this week when I was praying over the service. All this has happened from just spending 30 minutes to an hour a week listening to the Bible. Yes. All this transformation for most people has come from just this one time a week. See, this is why our team get so excited about these things because it has such significance and importance. So much because we're so busy has to be crammed into this one little nugget that we stress all week about in order for you to encounter God. And so, as I thought about these things, I thought, what's one thing we can say that we learned over the past few years? And if we've learned anything, and if you haven't learned this yet, I pray you learned it today. From these past few years, it's that sitting under and listening to the teachings of Jesus have been the most significant and defining usage of our time. Out of everything else we do, this has been the most significant, impactful thing we can do with our time. It's easy to become busy. To be then what? Anxious and troubled and distracted by many things in this life. But we must remember to cling to that which we're beginning to learn. That only one thing is truly necessary. The receival and acceptance of the words of Christ. As Jesus himself taught us, Man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Like the body needs food, we need constant consumption of the teachings of Jesus, if we wish to effectively follow him. This is my point, and the lesson I want you to consider this morning. Before we start going, we need to make sure that we sit in preparation. And before we begin to act, we need to take time to listen for direction. In order to function properly, we must take the time to sit and listen to receive and accept the word of God. Amen? Amen. Amen? Now, in order to discuss this topic further, so that this isn't just, a, so you don't see that like this is just like an opinion or a thing that we already want to tell you. We're going to look at Jesus, all right? So he's going to tell you, so if you got a problem, you can take it up with him. Okay? <laughs> so we're going to look at what Jesus taught for us in the Gospel of Luke. It's a relatively short passage that we're going to look at today. Um, but if we were to, to, you know, bring everybody up to speed to where we're at in Luke chapter 10, so what has happened thus far in Luke's gospel is having established the base of his ministry in northern Israel, which is known as the Galilean region, Jesus has gathered his first disciples, and he begins his journey towards Jerusalem, which is ultimately his end goal, as he travels, preaches, heals, and ministers to all who would receive him, he eventually amasses a following of some 84 individuals. He's got a pretty big group of people. It's at this point that Jesus decided to build a bigger church. So he 
he could house everybody inside of it and keep bringing people in. And bring, not just Stephen, that's not at all what Jesus did. Contrary to what, to what we like to do, Jesus sent them out. He equipped them and said, okay, now you go and you do what I have first shown you. Right? That's what he does here. And so he has these 84 individuals. And at this point, Luke tells us that Jesus then appointed 72 of them. Man, I would have been a little bit more comfortable maybe sending him like half. Right? But no, Jesus sends 72 of them. It says appointed 72 of them, excluding the 12 disciples who stayed with them, and sent them, the 72, to go on ahead of him. Two by two into every town and place where he himself was about to go. So like laborers going into a field before sowing is done, these 72 were sent out to prepare the soil that is the hearts of the people to receive Jesus upon his arrival to their city, town, or village. Not only does Jesus at this point entrust the ministry into the 12, the hands of the 12, but a portion is given to every single person who is following him at this point. Who these 72 people were remains a mystery. Luke did not write them down. He probably didn't know who all 72 were, but he knew there were 72. But what's implied, though, reading this passage, that one pair of disciples came from the household of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. Lazarus, Mary, and Martha in Bethany. Jesus specifically uh, commanded the 72 to find welcoming families to invest in so that upon his arrival he would already have connections made, the, the basis of the gospel message would have been, you know, the foundation of that would have been laid, and also that Jesus would have a place to recuperate, to rest, to be fed, to be able to prepare himself for the next stop. And so, Lazarus Mary and Martha, all siblings, were told provided such a place for Jesus. And according to the Gospel of John, John tells us that this, this, uh, these, uh, these three would eventually become very close friends with Jesus. John tells us that Lazarus would die and be raised by Jesus, and Mary and Martha would be amongst the women who were the first to witness Jesus' own resurrection. These are special and significant people. Their home in Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. So Jesus is almost done. He's almost to his destination. So this is likely the last stop that he makes. It's a household that sets the stage for one of Jesus' simplest but most significant teachings on discipleship. Where he reminds his followers that only one thing is truly necessary. His word. So if you have a Bible with you, if you haven't already, go ahead and open that up to Luke chapter 10. If you don't have one with you and you're visiting with us today, make sure to grab one from the seats and know that you are welcome to take those with you if you need one. Um, but if, if you have a little bit of difficulty flipping through that, I know the print is very small in those. We do have the words on the screens as well. So feel free to use any of those options. But we're going to be reading from Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 40. Excuse me through 42. 38 through 42. So, understanding the background that we've already shared, verse 38 says, Now as they, Jesus and his disciples, went on their way, Jesus entered a village. We know from John that this is Bethany. And a woman named Martha welcomed Jesus into her home. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teachings. So the scene is set where Jesus has been traveling around. He's been staying on these different people's places, you know, going, going, going. This is probably, like I said, the last stop. So he enters this home. And so you can interpret this many different ways because, well, there's just not as much information as I would like to give you. Okay? Now, this pair of disciples could have been someone outside this family, and Mary and Martha and Lazarus, his, his household was someplace that, you know, two of the 72 went and equipped this could mean that Lazarus and Martha were two of the 72. This could mean that Mary and Martha are two of the 72. It could mean any of these things. Okay? But what's clear is that they are followers of Jesus, and Jesus 
has come to their town, and they are going to provide a place for Jesus to stay. They are going to feed Jesus and the twelve. They're going to take care of him. So think about this. <laughs> you live in this little cottage, and you get word that the Messiah is coming with the twelve disciples. And he has said he's going to stay at your house. Okay? That's a little bit of pressure for me. You know, like, I freak out when someone comes over and announces because I'm, like, throwing stuff in every crevice to try to make sure it looks clean so that you people think that I'm a normal human being. Okay? So, like, I'm, like, scattering all over the place. All right? Well, Martha finds out, like, there's no way that Jesus can call. He shows up one day. Martha, I'm here to stay. She's like, oh! You know? So, running through her house, getting everything put together. She has, obviously, I mean, she had, is he, she's got family that can help her and things like that. And, and, and there are other people that are in the home with her. But, you know, the guests are Jesus as well. And so Martha is trying to make sure they have everything that they need. Right? It's her home. She is serving the Lord. Okay? Now, some people interpret this that, that Martha is is. is you know, for, is getting things prepared, you know, for Jesus, like a meal or something like that. Some people interpret this as Martha is out ministering to people for the sake of the gospel. It could be either one of those things. We're not told what it is. But either way, Martha is serving the Lord as he has commanded her to do. She is actively doing what he has told her to do. To serve others. So she is trying to serve others. And she... As she is running around, either trying to take care of the twelve or helping those in her own community, whatever that may be, she looks and sees her sister sitting on the ground and listening to Jesus. Now, in our hearts, we know that that's a good thing to sit at the feet of Jesus. And if you're ever to be given that opportunity, we should seize that. But when you are frantically running around trying to do more than you're capable of doing, if you see somebody sitting down, doesn't it annoy you? It doesn't annoy you really because you're mad at them for not helping. It's because you're jealous of them. Because you want to sit down, but you feel like you can't. Right? That's what's happening. So Martha... <laughs> is running around. She is busy. Alright? <laughs> and Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus. And it says in verse 40, though, in the beginning, it says, but Martha was distracted with much serving. And if you take this word serving, and you look it up in the original language, what it means is the same word that we get the title deacon from. It is to be someone who is a minister, someone who is ministering, someone who is serving. So that is the title that she is given here, that she is ministering. It doesn't matter what she's doing, she's ministering. So she is doing all this stuff for Jesus, and Mary's sitting there doing nothing. That's what she sees it as, right? She sees it as, she can give it as laziness. <laughs> And it says, and she went up to Jesus and said, can you imagine, Jesus is in the middle of teaching, and Martha, oh, excuse me, Jesus. I don't know if you noticed, um, but while I'm working my tail off and could really use a hand, uh, Mary is just sitting here. She said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Makes about herself here a little bit, right? Do you not care about me, Jesus? Am I not doing what you told me to do? I'm doing what you told me to do. I'm running around. I'm serving. I'm helping people. And Mary's just sitting here. And you, did you do not care? Make her get up and help me. You sent us two by two. I shouldn't be doing this by myself. Let me come on. Get her up. She's not going to listen to me, right? She doesn't even worry about going to Martha. She's going to bring to Jesus. She's like, Jesus, make her get up. And then in verse 41, it says, But the Lord answered her, 
and he repeats her name twice. And this is done in a way that is to express gentleness. And so although Jesus rebukes her, he does it in a loving way. And he says, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. You are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion. That one thing that is necessary, she takes time to sit at my feet and listen to my words. She's receiving and accepting them. She's getting what she needs. What you need, what is needed. And I'm not going to take that away from her. Whether Martha was preparing a meal for Jesus, whether she was serving as well or ministering in another way, it's important to understand that Martha isn't doing anything bad or sinful. Martha isn't doing anything bad or sinful. What she is using her time for is good. She's serving the Lord. She's striving, putting all that she can into what she's doing that she may obey the words Jesus has spoken to the 72 when he sent them out in the first place. As he instructed them, these were the instructions. He says, whatever house you enter, first say, peace be on this house, and remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for a laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Then, just before, if you read the section of scripture between that, before documenting the Mary and Martha story, Luke even inserts the parable of the Samaritan. Thus reinforcing Jesus' words to serve God by serving others, saying very boldly, now you go and do likewise. You go and do likewise. In this narrative, Martha is doing the work of a faithful disciple. She is. She's literally going and doing likewise. Her intentions are pure. Her actions are praiseworthy. Yet Jesus makes it clear she's still in the wrong in this situation. You see, what's wrong isn't what she's doing, but rather what she isn't doing. The reason Jesus gently rebukes Martha and denies her request to tell her sister to help her is because Martha's priorities are out of order. So consumed with all the good to do, she ignores the one thing that is necessary to take time to just sit and listen to Jesus. She's forgotten that in order to function properly in her role as a disciple, she needs to first just sit down next to her sister and listen to Jesus. As we read it, Martha was preoccupied with much serving. She'd become unnecessarily busy, making herself anxious and troubled, distracted by many things, and so failed to receive and accept the teachings that were being spoken in her very home. There was so much good to do, though, right? So much good to do around her. So many people to serve. She wanted to serve all. Her heart was in the right place. But she lost sight of the one thing she needed most. I like to think of it as like a cross-country runner. Right? Like Martha's that cross-country runner who fails to take time to stretch and map out the course. 
So she's just off running about. And now she's cramping up and moving aimlessly through the woods. <laughs> That's where she is. She knows she's supposed to be running. So she just keeps running. But there's no direction. There's no refreshing. There's no refreshment in it. She was pouring herself out for the sake of others, doing what she felt called to do, but lacked proper preparation and direction. This is why we see Martha running around, stressed out, and frustrated. By the time she approaches Jesus, it's safe to say that she's about empty. The tank that is her sanity and ability has run dry. Because she hasn't stopped to fill up. Ironically, the very thing that inspired her actions in the first place, who made her what she is, is now the thing that she feels she don't have time for. Isn't this such an easy trap to fall into? Like, for real, let's, let's just be honest. Like, that's such a, such, such an easy trap to fall into. It's easy to make yourself busy. It's easy in this life, in this world, in this culture, to be anxious, troubled, and distracted by even the good things in our life. It's so easy that we so often miss opportunities like this to just sit and listen to Jesus' spirit-filled, life-giving, perfecting words. Each Sunday, this chance is given. Now, we aren't fortunate enough to um, have Jesus preaching every week, so you have to settle for Aaron for the time being. But his teachings still reside, okay, and resound in our midst. Do they not? Amen? Amen? Right? Okay, I hope so. Okay, I hope you know that, that I, this ain't Aaron. This is Jesus, all right? Um, <laughs> I know that a lot of people just see worship service as just another thing to check off their to-do list. Just like, it's, not that anybody thinks it's a bad thing, okay? But most people don't think that, like, what we're doing here is a bad thing, okay? But they see it as just one good option out of the many others that they have. But I want you to know that this time is important. This time is important. It's more important than work. It's more important than your kids' soccer game. Sorry. It's not sorry. Um, it's, it's more important than that extra hour or two of sleep that you can take later in the day. Which I do every Sunday as a kid Literally like 3 o'clock. You better believe you ain't talking to me for two hours, all right? But, you know, that's, that's what it is. Like, this is time to sit. Like, like I said, I know that we aren't as fortunate enough to have Jesus here. Sorry. But this is still time to sit and listen to his word, to be fed, fueled, and strengthened, to receive the help and guidance we so desperately need each and every week. Because I think we can all agree that we need it. I once had the opportunity to spend some time with an archbishop of the Anglican Church. Okay, it was really cool. Uh, I got, I sat, we were both at this conference, ironically, together, and we were sitting at, at this table, and I was just sharing about, he was asking me all about, you know, what I was doing. At that time, I was up in Palmyra, and I was a little country church, and I was talking about it, and then I was like, hey, what do you do? And he goes, oh, I'm the archbishop of the Anglican Church. I just got back from my seven, all right, my five continent tour. It's like, oh, wow, okay, so. <laughs> Never have I felt so out of place. <laughs> but I'm sitting there with this archbishop, and he, we have our conversation transition to that of communion. And he said this to me. I'm not sure what happens or how to explain it. But when I take communion, when I come to a place of worship, I'm given the strength I need to persevere through the week to come. I'm reminded of the grace of Jesus. And I recall that he supplies all that I need. He is the archbishop, so it's pretty good. Okay. Like, but this is what happens when we take time to sit and listen to the words of Christ. 
Do you know what happens? Anxiety is replaced with peace. Confusion is overshadowed by understanding. Strength is provided. Direction is given. Hope is bestowed. It is bestowed and restored. And you know what else? <laughs> Our souls are nourished. Something that we can't do on our own. Like the homes Jesus stopped and replenished himself in along the journey to Jerusalem, we need to make sure that we're stopping and replenishing ourselves along our journey that is living this life. Sunday service is one of those pit stops, all right? Like, that allows us to just take a break, stretch. Reevaluate the map and fill up. The reason we're all so worn out, that we're all so stressed, is that we've skipped the pit stop, ran out of gas, and then have to find ourselves backtracking to the place that we should have stopped at in the first place. I don't know if you've ever ran out of gas. It's embarrassing. Yes, thank you. Somebody else, okay? Sadly, I have done it twice in my life. It shouldn't have happened once, but for me it has twice because I was so busy. I had to get there. I thought I could make it. And guess what happens? I get stuck on the side of the road. And then I'm super late and I miss a thing that I was supposed to go to anyways. And then I'm just even more stressed out. And guess where I have to go before I can go do anything else right? I have to go to the gas station where I should have stopped in the first place. <laughs> Which is what we do. <laughs> this is what we do. Right? We wait until we run out of gas, till our life is in shambles. And then we go, oh, I better start backtracking to Jesus. That's okay. He'll receive you. He'll fill up your tank for free. But you are the one who put yourself through all that other mess. All that hiking. Really? Why would you want to do that? <laughs> like Martha, we have a tendency to just go and act on our own ability. We have a tendency to spiritually starve ourselves to the point that we run out of energy. And church, I'm, I'm not saying this to like make you feel bad. I'm just telling you, like, this is just how it is, okay? And this isn't right. Every week someone comes up to me and says, I'm just too busy. We just got too much going on right now. Okay, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not being sarcastic with that, okay? Like, that's fine. I know that Sunday doesn't always work for everybody. I know that Sunday mornings sometimes don't work for anybody. Okay? But what are you doing in place of it? Is the question. What are you doing in place of it? So if you can't, if this isn't an option, then what else are you doing? Right? Like, are you are you taking like 30 minutes in the week to just pray? To read? To listen to the message from this church or the millions of other ones that are online now? Because we all are. Right? Like, like are you getting involved in, in, a, in a group that we offer or one from another church? I mean, like, when people say that, this is just what I think, like, it's like saying, well, I can't eat Sunday morning, so I guess I won't eat the rest of the week. I can't eat Sunday morning, so I guess I just won't eat the rest of the week, right? Like, imagine, in a literal sense, like, what that would do to your body. What neglect would do to your body. Yet, this is how we have been taught to treat our souls. This isn't your fault. This is what you've been shown. And I want you to be strengthened. Jesus wants you to be strengthened. All right? So even if you don't care what I think, I hope you care about what Jesus says. Right? Busyness isn't a valid excuse to neglect your relationship with God. Amen. Okay? It's not. It's, 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 even if what you're doing is good. 
It's, it's not a valid reason any more than saying you're too busy to eat a meal. We need the constant consumption of the teachings of Jesus just as much as we need the bread that we work so hard to keep on the table. Because we are not meant to live just on bread alone, but every word that pursues from the mouth of the Lord, who gives you the bread that you have. Right? So, man, I rolled so many different things over in my head. Of like, I really wrestled with this because I was like, man, how do we apply this? Okay, what is something that we can do right now? Because one of the things I, I can't stand, I should say, I can't stand is when like I sit under a sermon and I've been I've done this too, so I'm not saying that Aaron gets this right all the time. But like you hear like all about the scripture, you hear all about you know all these different things, you learn all these things, like but then the, the pastor just kind of is like, okay, have a good week. Okay, well, uh, thanks for making me feel bad about my own. What am I supposed to do with this? Right? What am I supposed to do with it? I think it's going to be different for each one of you. I really do. But for me, this is something that I've decided that I'm going to do, so I'm going to encourage you to do it, is I'm setting a reminder on my phone that's going to go off every week that said, that's asking me the question, did you sit and listen? Did you sit and listen? Okay? Because, like, we're on our phones all the time. So that's probably going to be the best option for me. Okay? I don't know what it is for you. If you don't have it on your phone, maybe you can write that on a piece of paper and stick it up on your mirror. I am literally not asking for you to be like, I want you to spend 15 minutes a day. If you feel compelled to do so, obviously do so. But... <laughs> I'm literally asking you to make sure that you're at least stopping once a week to fuel up. Whether that be here, whether that be in a group, whether that be on, at home, online, you have unlimited access. So take it, okay? If we have learned anything from these past two years, it's what? That sitting and listening to the teachings, sitting under and listening to teachings of Jesus have been the most significant and defining usage of our time. Okay? That's what we've learned when we look back. Now let's keep that moving forward. Amen? Let's not forget this. Because God's doing awesome stuff, and I want him to continue to, and if he's not, he's going to, when we do this. It's the reason we're able to celebrate together today. Amen? Amen? It's because of Jesus that we get to celebrate. So before we start going, okay, not just leaving here, before I blow up that bounce house and get in there with the kids, before we start going, all right, let's make sure that we sit in preparation. Which is what we're doing now. So you get a little bit of that. And you're going to get that during communion. But let's make sure that we reflect upon these things. And before we act and start judging people on their chili, <laughs> which I am excited about, <laughs> let's listen to these words of direction. Okay? Let's be like Mary. Let's strive to learn like Martha. To take the time to sit and listen, to receive and accept the words of Christ. I guarantee you will never regret that time. It's the one thing that is necessary. Would you bow to me? Holy and gracious Father, we come before you today and we thank you for who you are. God, we thank you that you are so patient with us. God, we thank you that regardless of where we're at in our journey, regardless of where we are at in our understanding of you, that you, God, are near to us. It was Augustine who said that, God, even when I feel farthest from you, you are always near to me. So it doesn't matter where we're at today. Today is a day, Father, that we proclaim that we are going to make you a priority. That we're going to take time to sit and 
listen, to receive and accept. Because God, we need that more than we need anything else. God, every single person bears your image that is present in this place. Everything that is beheld in this place is because of you, your faithfulness, the words that you have given us, that have given us hope and understanding and faith and salvation. And God, we are so thankful to be here with friends and family. We're so thankful, God, to be in your presence. God, as we celebrate today, whether we're in the back taking pictures, whether we're jumping on the bounce house, whether we're singing along with the music, whether we eat chili, whatever we are doing today for our celebration, may we remember you. You are the one who created the joys that we experience in this life. And so we thank you, Jesus. Help us to slow down. To not be so anxious. God, you promised us that we would just approach you. That although we all bear burdens, as long as we live in this life, that you will come alongside us and you will shoulder those things with us. As Jesus promised us, we can accept and believe that these things are true. That your yoke is life. And in following you and taking time to walk with you and to listen to you, you promise us in your word that we will find the rest of our souls so very much needed. God, we praise your name. We thank you for who you are and all that you have done through this community and all that you have done, Father, over the last few years. It is all you and we praise you and we thank you. In your son's name, we pray these things and lift them up. But he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more lightly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest upon me. And in these hardships, in these trials that we face in life, let us remember that Jesus has indeed overcome the world. John 16, verse 33. Jesus says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. He has given us his strength. He has given us the helper, the Holy Spirit, that lives within us. And Jesus' name is holy. And there's power in his name. And there's power in knowing that we are never alone. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. There, therefore God has highly exalted him and has freely bestowed upon him the name that is above every name. That at the mention of his name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Of those in heaven, those on earth, those under the earth 
and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. These are words straight out of God's holy truth. And in the hardships of this world, we may be tempted to turn to other things to satisfy our souls while we are trying to persevere life's trials. But let us remember that Christ himself is the bread of life, and his word is sustenance for our soul's deepest desires. And his word is also a lamp unto our feet. His grace and forgiveness covers us so that we may forgive others and cover them with his love. Let us truly be a people who love others the way Jesus loves us. Would you please bow your head and pray with me? Lord of my life, King Jesus, you told us to remember you. In the night before, you were taken away and tortured. You had to suffer with your disciples. And you said to them, after you took the bread and gave thanks, you broke it. And you said to them, take and eat, this is my body. And then you took the cup and you gave thanks for it. And you gave it to them, saying, drink from it all of you. This is my blood, the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Thank you, God, for your grace and forgiveness that covers us. Please help us to forgive others and cover them with the love and grace that you have so given us. Help us to be a people who love others the way you love us. May all we do glorify your holy name, King Jesus. I have a list of scripture that I meditated upon. If anyone would like the passages that I refer to, let me know. And if there's anyone who has not yet taken Christ as their Lord and Savior, please see Aaron or any one of us at the prayer station after service so that we may pray with you and answer any questions that you may have about the love that God has specifically set aside for you. And we do also need to plug in to the Word, to the Holy Word. If you don't already have a Bible or know where to start, we've got resources and we can help you. Communion is open for all believers. The elements are located at these two tables. You may now rise and take the elements.
guys so much for joining us for this year's celebration today. Really excited. We've got a lot of fun planned for after service, so um, we'll be still on. But for now, I will give my announcements. So upcoming is next week is Halloween. Pretty excited. MJ is cool. <laughs> Say goodbye. Afterwards, fellowship together.